Hi, I'm Edwin Samuelson, and welcome to The Cinephiles. This week, it's a very, very special show. It will be the first of a three-part series on the new James Bond series. Well, not the new James Bond series, but it's going to tie in with the new James Bond film, which is Casino Royale, and the new DVD releases of all the first 20 films of James Bond. But before I begin, I want to introduce my panel to my left, Mr. Eric Cohen, and to his left, Mr. Michael Foltz. But anyway, before we begin, let's uh, get ready to talk about, well, actually, let's begin. The James Bond series, let's start out. James Bond, the original superhero, uh, super, uh, I guess, a secret agent who super started- Super spy. Super, yeah, the original super spy. action hero. Yeah, Spawn. i probably say the longest running film series Quite in history. Quite possibly the most influential film character. Definitely up there. Everyone has parodied it's a James Bond at one point or another. There isn't an action film that hasn't somewhat been inspired by James Bond. And, let's, and let me tell you, James Bond was more influential back in the old days than you think because when Alfred Hitchcock made North by Northwest, he went on record by saying that that was how he would do James Bond. North by Northwest came out in 1957. I know, but when he was interviewed later, when oh, they talked I talked about him saying. doing a Bond film, he said, uh, I have already did my Bond, and it was North by Northwest. Okay. Wow. And also I want to say about No, he was, a, he was a seer. You're wrong. <laughs> Another thing about interesting about James Bond, I guess they, it started a new genre, the super spy movies. In fact, the, the, there were so many knockoffs. In fact, there was a film, I don't bet you guys didn't know this, that James Bond, or I'm sorry, Sean Connery's brother actually played a secret agent in. I don't know the name of the top of the film. Operation uh, Kid Brother, I think it was called. Neil Connery. Hey, if you can't get Sean Connery, Why do I know get that? the next best. I'm and embarrassed. And, and, the, and the kid actor in it that <clears throat> played his sidekick was uh, uh, Don Swayze. That's an inside joke for some people, and it's not very funny. So. <laughs> and you're laughing. I'm you laughing. I'm bitch. laughing in pity of myself. All yeah. right. Well, anyway, the first film. Matt, Matt Helm was a, uh, a knockoff. Yes, uh, he was. Man called Flint. Yeah, our man Flynn with the, James and Mike Co Flynn Coburn and Michael Caine, respectively. Um, but the first bit film actually is Doctor No. The original, the first film they added, the actually that uh, Henry Saltzman and uh, is it Albert Cubby Bro Broccoli? Cubby Broccoli wanted to film was Thunderball, but they had problems with the rights, which we'll get to later. So they decided to film Doctor No with a unknown actor. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. I'm going to set the record straight on this. It says that in the documentary. By the way, yeah, Eric is our resident James. This Bond man is expert. a official even though we're aficionado. huge fans, he's the expert. Go ahead, Eric. No, no. What they wanted. That this is the deal. Thunderball was supposed to be the first. James Bond movie, but this was before Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman were even involved in it. Uh, what happened was Kevin McClory, I forgot who the other uh, producer came to Ian Fleming and said, we want to make a James Bond film. And at the time, you know, Bond was, was sort of a popular uh, fictional character, and they decided to get together and they, they wrote a script together, which turned out to be Thunderball. Now, what happened was the film fell apart and Fleming needed a new idea for a novel, so his next novel became Thunderball. Hence, why all this legal wrangling went on. And Since yeah. then, um, he he kind of did the novel without getting any any credit. The other screenwriter, I think his name was Jack Whittingham or something like that. That's, that's I believe that's right. It is right, Whittingham. and that's the deal. That was that would have been the first James Bond movie, but it wouldn't have had anything to do with the broccoli and the Saltzman guys. And those that, guys came in. I don't think they'd be able to afford the budget. Doctor No was. That's the film they selected to be the first one because they thought that would be the most cinematic. And it also was a, a I guess you could say, could be a pretty a low budget film because it wasn't as spectacular as the later Bond films. And I love Doctor No. Doctor No is a very different Bond film compared to the other ones. It's, is that it's, it's fascinating because it's the first one. They don't quite have the formula yet. They don't have the theme song uh, w during the opening credits. Like you know what the it's more of a beatnik type the song. The themes. Well, no, no. First, well, the, the three blind mice. The, the three. No, no. The song opens with the James Bond theme and then it turns into three blind. Yeah, yeah, but I mean well, the, the song, song is versus the uh, the theme by uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Monty Norman. Oh, you're talking about? Okay, I thought you. Were talking I mean, about I'm talking about like the well, like no, woman, you know, and oh, the, no, no, the no, they title don't, sequences. No, but but they don't have that stuff. But it's still quintessential Bond. What's fascinating about the film is, although it has its fantastic elements, it's 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 basically what Fleming wanted his books to be, basically a British Mike Hammer. Well, what is interesting too is that Sean Connery, as we all know today, is a superstar because of this film, was actually not even, he was really way down the list on the list of well, choices, Ian wasn't Fleming he? Fleming wanted David Niven. And when Sean Connery was cast, Ian Fleming was very angry and said uh, Sean Connery reminded him of a cab driver. 
<laughs> well, he was a Mr. Universe, and he, uh, he was suggested by, I believe, Cubby's wife after she saw him in Dario Gil Garby O'Gill and, Garby Little, Gil Pete. and Little People. And uh, Sean Connery is... The this is, but this is the this is also demyth demythologizing. Is that the word? How about declassified? De de no, whatever. No, no, but the fact of the matter was, Connery in England at the time wasn't not famous. He was he was already somewhat uh, a well respected theater actor. He was all, already done a lot of television. He'd done like a bunch of Shakespeare on TV and stuff like that. So it wasn't like he was this guy that came out of nowhere. It was just a Mr. Universe. He had some acting chops mm -hmm. uh, before he played Bond. It's just that to international audiences, he was unknown. Really? Well, I like, I like um, Dr. No a bit because, I mean, you have, of course, you have the definitive James Bond, in my opinion, Mr. Sean Connery. And you also have Joseph Wiseman as the bad, as the bad guy. Great He's actor. Very Great good story. actor. You're nothing but a cop, Mr. Bond. And I, Great line. And I love, I also love that it has probably one of the most influential sequences in a Bond film, which has been repeated a few times, which is honey riders emerging from the uh, oceans. Iconic. Iconic image. In fact, it's been parried in, um, um, what is it, Austin Powers. In fact, and it's been parodied in the Bond films. Yes, right. and, Doc, and, Doc, and, and Die Another Day. And too. And in fact, it was just parried in uh, Casino Royale. Yes. With, but they subverted it. They subverted it. Um, but how yeah, does this, I think that's enough. Uh, how does this, how does this, two homages well, is enough. How does this enough. rate on the James Bond scale for you? I mean, do you think it was a good template for the series as a whole? I think it's a fa I, it's, it's, I Honestly, it's one of my favorites. I mean, I would say the first three Bond films are my favorite Bond films. Uh, I think it's a fascinating one because it's the first one. There's things about it that I really like, which you never see ever again in a Bond film. Like, I love uh, Connery's first initial interpretation of the character. He's such a bastard. I mean, he is, he's just such an arrogant, cocky, racist bastard just in this as film. Just as the novels were. And it's, it's fascinating because this film was made in 1961, and they're just not afraid to make him a bastard. I mean, you've heard all this lore about I, I how they have I don't know how racist censorship. he is in the, in the films. Oh, to quarrel, he's like, fetch my shoes. You know, he just treats them like oh, yeah. other shit. The, the Ian Fleming books are very racist. And the books are very yeah, racist. Very racist. He's more, he, I was going to say, he's much more sexist than he is racist, I thought. Well, he's both. He's just an arrogant bastard. They said it's a really, it's Ian Fleming. That's his, his, his character, you know, as the secret agent. And it's interesting how as in the series, it kind of softened the character as it became more popular. You know, because like the first two, like like we'll get fresh, we'll get into fresh a little bit later. But but in the, but in the first one, I mean, it's just the way you, know, you just shoots a guy in the back, and you heard the stories about how censor, you know, they're afraid of the censors. Will they be able to get away? He's more cold blooded. That? He's more cold blooded, I would say. Completely because. ruthless in this one. And he uses his license to kill. And the other mm -hmm. films, you know, he would just knock a guy out. And he's more of a detective in this one too, which is kind of interesting. And I also like the one thing I thought was very interesting is that they had like a little bit of folklore in the movie where mm -hmm. there's there's a dragon is attacking the island, you know, which you find out later is not what it appears. Well, they to kind be. of done that later one. Live and Let Die with the voodoo stuff and things like that. But, but it's it's a very good film. It's if it's different, but keep in mind it is very different from the James Bond films that followed it. It is very dry. But Joseph Wiseman is a good villain in Doctor No. Honey Rider is okay. She kind of plays an idiot. She's not. I like my Bond girl smart. Not exactly the brightest bulb on the ceiling. Um, and that's Ursula I, Andress, I, I view Doctor No as a very dry film. It's enjoyable. I love the appearance of Quarrel. I thought he was a great character, um, but I, I think it's very, very dry. Well, one thing too I want to mention too is there's no key, there is no uh, cue in this film. The gadgets are very, very limited, and it's very different. Are they technically there is a cue in the film? That's I'm sorry, I take that back. But it it's Major Boothroyd. It's a yeah, different it's not actor, Desmond Llewellyn. Which which actually is the character in the uh, cue in the books is Major Boothroyd. Who we find out. Major Boothroyd, and if you ever see Dr. No, he's a character that comes out uh, and gives Bond his Walther PPK at the beginning of the film. He's Mr. Gadget, as people will refer to him who don't know the, his name. But anyway, uh, that's, that, that film started the series and became, was pretty successful, and it was enough to spawn a sequel. And the next film was chosen after John F. Kennedy named it one of his favorite books, correct? Yes. The, the book is From Rush With Love. And uh, in fact, recently, it is so influential, it got just today's audiences, it was transferred into a video game with Sean Connery reprising his role as the most famous detective, I'm sorry, secret agent ever, Mr. James Bond. And uh, it followed the movie very well, closely. Um, From Rush With Love is, a, is considered by many to be one of the finest James Bond films. In fact, it's considered to be uh, Sean Connery's best film, if I'm not mistaken. Is, uh, and I will James say, Bond. for my money, it's one of the best. Probably my second favorite, Connery Bond. And I'll tell you one reason why. The main reason why. Robert Shaw? Robert Shaw's fantastic. And you know why Robert Shaw's fantastic. And you hardly ever see this in the Bond films, which I would like to see them get back to. 
what they're doing now. I have no idea. But I love the idea of a physical and mental equal to Bond, and that was Robert Shaw's uh, agent, the Russian agent. What was his name in the? the uh, his I name forget. is uh, Red Grant. Red Grant. I love a Bond having a nemesis that was just as smart and just as good a fighter. You could tell they were like physical equals. Even tougher. Even tougher. I in don't fact. know. And I like well, the, not necessarily because Bond wins that. So and I you also, can't be tougher when you lose the fight. What is the name of the, the I forgot, but there's a Russian woman. Yeah, uh, that's Lottie Lenya, the German actress the, uh, who plays Rosa Klebb. I, I love From, I love from Russia with Love is probably my favorite Bond She's movie. A great I mean, villain. you're talking about Hitchcock. If Hitchcock made a Bond film, it would be like From Russia with Love. And From Russia with Love is, is probably, for me, it's, 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 it's the one Bond film where all the elements work. You know, where the direction, the writing, the acting, everything just kind of... There's, a, there's right. odd parts to it, though, too. Like, the whole thing with the uh, the cat fight with the gypsy. It is odd, that's but that's part strange. adds to the exoticism for me. Uh, it, it's, it's a film that reminds you that this is an exotic adventure. And I love the whole Orient Express stuff, and, and it has what is probably one of the best fight sequences in the history of film, that down and dirty fight between Red Grant and uh, Bond in, in the car of, uh, in the cabin of the, the train. That's a bloodthirsty fight. I love Robert it's Shaw. It's spectacular. And, 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 but both, the, the, all three villains, he has little screen time, the Grand Master, I, I think it's, I forgot the character's name, who's a chess champion, who's like the brains behind coming up with the scheme. In the novel, it's Smirsh. Smirsh is, is the Russian, the KGB arm. That that was Bond's nemesis in the novels. To me, it almost. But other than that, the novels, the movie's pretty faithful to the book. To me, it almost at the beginning reminded me, even though they didn't come out and say it, obviously, but it reminded me of the pre-Spectre. Like this was going to be the introduction to what Spectre was going to be all about with the whole training ground, what they have, which was Smirsh. But well, you, you saw. Know. I mean, uh, Ernst Ravel Blofeld's there. You know, yeah, exactly. You exactly. don't see his that face. Was, yet. That was the pre-Spectre, and I love like the the guy running away from the flamethrower and then throwing the knives and teaching hand to hand combat. And Red Grant's there, and Rosa Klebb puts on the uh, the coal miner's glove or brass knuckles and punches him right in the stomach. I like the thing I like about the Red Grant's character too is they allude to him that he, I believe he's mentally ill or he was taken from an asylum and trained to be an, a an agent. Is that, is that correct? Um, I forgot. I don't remember. But that, there's something but interesting about his character. I remember psychologically. He's just a fat. Well, Robert Shaw just makes a character. He's one of the best, most underrated, and best villains in a Bond film. I say top three, maybe. Definitely. And I'm having trouble thinking of the other two. That's how good he was. I, I love Robert Shaw, and uh, that was probably one of the most Great Bond ever. movie. Great Bond film. Then again, when was Robert Shaw ever bad? It's a, it's a, it's a classy Bond film, too. It's, there's just a lot of respect to the storytelling and, and the performances. And Connery's great in it as Bond. If you He's like... a little more human than, than what he becomes. If you like great series. characterization, I don't care in any movie. Not just a Bond film. Not in just a, a, a suspense slash action film. But if you like great characterization from Russia with Love, is definitely the one to check out. I think it's probably Sean Connery's best performance as Bond. Definitely up there. And because uh, the first one, he was a little rough because he was learning the character. Mm -hmm. But this one, he really mm -hmm. finds a fine balance of what we see in the later film. That's a good point. All right. Well, Russia with Love, definitely one of the best. Check that one out. All right. Well, let's bring us to our next film, which... Uh, Goldfinger. Like Goldfinger, which was originally supposed to be also directed by Terrence Young. But unfortunately, he had other prior commitments. And so the film was picked up this time by Guy Hamilton. And it's probably the most famous of the Sean Connery it's films. It's the most influential of all the Bond films. Uh, definitely. Because it totally made the Bond series the way we're accustomed to seeing it today. It was the biggest Bond, Bond uh, at that time. It was the right. one that That's the, the one biggest that success. really, really also, blew the lid off the whole Bond craze. It's also the one that started making the Bond theme song or the movie song that started carrying like a certain cachet to it. Mm -hmm. You know, with Shirley Bassey doing uh, Goldfinger, and then all of a sudden doing a Bond song as a performer or performers became a big deal. And people expected to see that every time they saw a Bond film because exactly. the song was so memorable. It's also the first tongue and cheek bomb. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, and, you know, for, for that kind of thing, I think it's, it's one of the better Bond films. You know, there, there are two kinds of Bond camps. There are guys that like their Bond serious and down and dirty, and they're the kinds that like their, you know, kind of tongue and cheek, smirky, campy kind of thing. And I, I like them both as long as they're done well. And I think Golden, uh, I was going to say Golden Eye, Goldfinger is definitely one of the best ones. I mean, it still holds up. It's Other the ones first tend one. to date. It's the first one of the, where it's a, I would say it's probably of the early ones, it's the best <laughs> merging of the camp slash seriousness, where it's not too serious and it's not too 
you know, silly. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when you have a movie with the, the lead bad uh, girl or the Bond girl is pussy galore, you know, come on. Well, it's, it's very sexy, yeah. Very good. Very sexy. Shirley Eaton, is that, is that correct? No, Shirley, no, Shirley Eaton was the one that gets painted in gold. It's, I'm so uh, sorry. It's, uh, what's her name? It was Honor original, Blackman. Honor, Honor Blackman. Blackman. Yeah, that's right. And then you got Gert Froby as uh, Goldfinger. Now we're talking about best villains. Gert Froby and Oddjob as his henchmen are probably the two. I actually, I would say they're uh, the Oddjob, a.k.a. Professor Tanaka. Yes. Hawaiian dude. Hawaiian, uh, what was he? What was this thing? He was a sumo wrestler or something uh, like professional that. Wrestler, professional actually. wrestler, actually. He was a sumo wrestler, then went into professional right. wrestling. Yeah. Actually, no, he was a professional wrestler first, and then he went into acting. But the thing I love about the whole Gerda Froby thing is he's so good at Harold it. Harold Sakata, by the way. That's not And yet he's, Gert Froby's entirely dubbed. Throughout the oh, yeah, you film. can tell, though. You can tell. But it was a very good dubbing job, and um, I like that they took some of the most l ludicrous ideas in the movie and mm -hmm. made them somewhat believable. I mean, they're going to break into Fort Knox with the gas and all this stuff. But well, it's a brilliant idea. I mean, it, they're not going to steal the I didn't gold. think it was that ludicrous. I mean, when you get down the road in bonds, yes, that's yes. when the ludicrous ideas it, come to back. the forefront. I'll take that back. I mean, it, it seemed, it, everything seemed sort of plausible. And I would say you talk about Connery's best performance as Bond, I think... Uh, his performance in this one is equal to From Russia with Love. It's just a, it's just a different take on the character. I mean, this, this is the first Bond film where he seems like he's having a lot of fun. You know, and, and he's starring that you can see like he's, he's good in Thunderball, but then you can sort of see that, okay, I'm getting sick of this. Oh, yeah. Ten minutes, ten minutes. Um, oh, I could, I could hear yeah. ten minutes yeah. on the speaker here. <laughs> that, that, was that was a that good, was that was the voice, Gloria. Of, that was the voice of God. Um, but, um, <laughs> the, well, I would say Goldfinger, uh, you can definitely tell it was from a new director, too, because mm -hmm. it's a different tone, as you said. But it's a very good movie. I like it. I think it's, it's probably, a lot of fun. It's a lot it's, of fun. It's good. It's if, good. I don't know if it's in the canon of the great, but it's good. It's definitely up. I think it's in the canon of the great. Well, the next film, as we were talking about earlier, was, uh, is, was Thunderball. Now, this, there's a documentary about it. It was probably one of the most anticipated films of its time because of Goldfinger, because Goldfinger was such a huge success, they rushed Thunderball into production. And it was a really huge, elaborate production. And uh, it was, at the time, the longest Bond film. And they brought back the original director, Terrence Young. And I believe, I find the film to be a mixed, a mixed batch. You know, it's all right. There's some really good things in it. I think it feels, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a weird film for me, because you don't get too caught up in it. It's not as engaging as the previous ones for some reason. But there's some cool things, like, like uh, What's his name? The villain Largo. Largo should be should have been much more impressive. Uh, he was, and he was uh, Largo to me seemed like a real grumpy old guy. Yeah, he's, it was. It was he, just kind of somebody's grandpa that the was power crazy. The lamest of the Sean Connery villains. But I what I liked a lot about Thunderball is it was the here we are finally introducing Spectre as the major villain. Uh, this was you know this is where it yeah. came to the forefront as Spectre. Um, I think there's a lot of fun. Thunderball, to me, is a fun film. It starts out, the name Thunderball is a great name. Second of all, uh, the great uh, theme song by uh, Tom Jones. Oh, God. I, I, I love it. One. Thunderball is a great song. I mean, how can you put Thunderball into a song and sing it like I, I, I like it. It's, it's, a great, it's a great song. Great song. And here we start getting his gadgets really on full force. You know, his little uh, the pocket thing that he can breathe in and uh, the little submarine that he takes. And the, I thought the battle at the end was great. I thought the battle went on way too long, and I was kind of bored because of the middle section took so uh, I could, I couldn't, to get to I, I, disagree, I couldn't disagree more because the, the agents parachuting in and then fighting the specter divers underneath. And only problem, the I only, like I, only I, I, I sort of agree with you, and I sort of agree with you. The only problem I have with, with uh, when Bond goes underwater which has happened a lot in Bond films, is that it's yes. really hard to tell who the hero is and who the villains are. You know, that's, it just gets like, yeah. visually, I just find it kind of annoying and especially kind of painful steals, to watch. Especially when it steals one of the bad guy's suits, you know, or whatever. Yeah, but I mean... No, yeah, no, I th not a suit, I, the, uh, um, the yeah. hover... Or the I, I, I like Thunderball. I think it's a, very, it's a fun, uh, fun enough movie. I just don't think it's a particularly memorable one for the length and all that stuff. It should have been a lot better. It does feel rushed. You know, it feels kind of sloppy in parts, like like so, some of the, the special effects, some of the action. I like think your problem with it, and maybe Edwin, your problem with it as well is, is compared to something like From Russia with Love or Doctor No, it's not the deepest of the Bond films. Well, no, no, no. I mean, it's unabashedly Goldfinger an action isn't, film. Goldfinger isn't deep. I think Goldfinger is a thousand times better than Thunderball. I think it's just more uh, fun. Thunderball. It felt is like more it took charged. more care with Thunder uh, with Goldfinger, whereas Thunderball feels like Thunderball sometimes feels like a badly dubbed movie to me. Well, all but, around. And, I think. 
think the, the, weakest, the weakest part of Thunderball is the fact that Largo is not a strong villain. But there's great scenes in it. Like, I love the scene where, where, where Connery's trying to escape from the bad guys, and, he, and he's going through that whole carnival thing, and he's slightly wounded, and he mm -hmm. actually looks scared. And I think that's a very impressive-looking sequence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there, there are really good things in it. And I like how he's like always sort of showing up Largo. Mm -hmm. you know? What I don't like about the film is the pacing. And the thing, too, another thing, I don't care for the cinematography in the film. I think it's a very, it's just not a very interesting looking film. Oh, by the way, that's another thing I want to answer, uh, mention. It is the first Connery, or sorry, Bond film to be shot in scope, if I'm not mistaken. I have no idea. And uh, it's not, it's just, I didn't feel it was very visually interesting. He goes to all these exotic locations, and I just thought it was very blandly photographed. Um, I saw Sean Connery look bored in parts. I mean, he, he's, there's some scenes he really is good in it. Some scenes you can really feel like he's just beginning to get bored of the mm -hmm. character, which I think you can agree with me on to a certain extent. He, he started to look, but there's still things there where he's just utterly charming. Like, I love that scene where he, he discovers uh, Fiona Volpe in his bathtub. And she asks him, uh, could you give me something to put on? And he just gives her shoes. That's a great moment. Mm -hmm. He just, like, sits back and looks at her. Quintessential Connery. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I consider Thunderball to be a, a mixed bag. You like it more than I did, and I think it's uh, it's the movie as a child. It was my favorite of Connery's. It was the one that I uh, conjured up the most uh, the most good memories of. Well, that'll bring us to our next Connery Bond, which is uh, was his last Bond film for a while, and it's a film that was shockingly or written by Raul Dahl. Well, yes. the original the original script. Yeah, uh, by Raul Dahl of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory fame. And, James uh, and the Giant Peach. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the witches. And um, the film. But it was not used. The shooting script was not well, used. Well, let me let me finish my introduction here. Um, that it was directed by um, at the time. Oh, I forget his name. Um, uh, Louis Gilbert. Louis Gilbert. Who returns later on in the film to direct two more Bonds. Um, the film concerns uh, Spectre going into outer space and uh, hijacking many uh, shuttle missions. I say space missions and holding people for ransom. Well, and kidnapping uh, kidnapping shuttles. Yes. And. Uh, at the time, it set a record for the most expensive set. In fact, the set was equal to the amount of the first Dr. No film, which is at $1 million. The set by Ken Adam is amazing. Um, unfortunately, I feel this film is a very weak entry in the Bond series because this one, Sean Connery really does look bored out of his mind. And apparently he really was. Apparently he hated being in Japan. Just, just, he just was so ready to stop being Bond when they started shooting. And, and, and to me, it, it looks it. He kind of sleepwalks through the film. This was like the first Bond film that kind of really derailed from the book series. You know, up until that point, I mean, even Goldfinger can argue has some semblance to, to the original novel it was based on. But, but, but You Only Live Twice was the first Bond film where it's like, okay, we're just not going to film the novels. We're just going to take the titles mm -hmm. and just do this like spectacular Bond thing. Because the book is so cool. But the problem is, You Only Live Twice, the book happens after Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And at this point, they weren't, you know, doing any continuity. And, and so, um, with the only look twice, I mean, there's, there's interesting things in the only look twice, some good lines, um, you know, but I just, again, I find it, you know, th that, that final battle in the underground volcano, to me, is just the best scene in the movie, but it I've seen it like so many times, and I just, I don't find anything up to that point all that really memorable. There's All great right. sets. Well, I enough, think the photography is great. And I think enough the sets are bashing great. this film. This I know is you my love favorite it. Connery. Uh, it, it's my favorite get, Connery film. Get out it of is here. awesome. I love it. It is. I'm wondering just, I've never read the Roald Dahl script. I don't know if it's available or not. He's credited, though. And if you, he, but he's credited I as think a, a lot of his imagination went into this film. Whether he was credited or mm -hmm. not. Uh, with you know story by credit or whatever, I don't think he was given a story by credit on that, and I don't think no, he was yeah. given. No, he, oh, he was. A, if you see the movie, it says screenplay by Roald Dahl. Oh, okay. He's okay. the only one. I, if I'm not mistaken, actually gets a credit. Someone else might have rewritten it, yeah. but they don't get a credit. See, I heard they I weren't of. using his shooting script. I knew that. Well, a lot of his concepts were used in the film. So. But I think um, I absolutely adore it. I love uh, finally seeing Blofeld's face after just seeing him stroking the cat. Please Donald Pleasance. Do the wonderful Donald Pleasance. Even though it changed over time, it became Charles Gray. It, you know, it, it was... Telly uh, Savalas. Yeah, Telly Savalas, exactly. The Donald Pleasance Blofeld was the inspiration for Dr. Evil, by the way. Yeah, somewhat. There you go. Um, and I think that, well, along with Lauren Michaels. Yes. But um, I think that uh, I loved... This is where I started loving the surreal as aspects of Bond. I just absolutely adored them. And the ninja battle at the end, I didn't even realize that they were ninjas at the end. Uh, I loved Tiger Tiger, his ally. I loved Tiger him. Tiger Kanaga. 
Yeah, but they called him Tiger Tiger. And and, uh, and then I love the I love when they brought out the uh, the helicopter kit, which was uh, the, you know they brought out the team of guys with the bamboo suitcases. And Tiger Tiger's like, oh, what do you got there, Bond? A toy? And then he assembles it, and it's amazing. And then uh, once again, Spectre's in full force. Well, I gotta say, we only have a few, I'm like a minute or two left, but um, I want to say um, this one has a, one of the best theme songs in a movie. Yes, I, love, yes. I, love I agree theme with song. you. I'm glad you I brought that up. Nancy Sinatra. Sinatra. Not Sinatra. And I say it's beautifully shot in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, gorgeous the cinematography. is amazing. The one, of the best, best. one of the best cinematography in the series, actually. And um, the one thing I don't care for, and I think it's a story that's a little preposterous. Talk about preposterous, going into outer space and all, all this. And also, I thought... Pretend, you know, faking Sean Connery's, I'm sorry, James Bond's death, and then for him to pretend that he's Japanese is kind of pushing it. Okay, I agree with you on that. But the idea of space, the way they did it, though, wasn't that over the top. Well, you see, I don't, I didn't mind that. I think I didn't mind any of the fantastic elements of it. It just seemed oh. like this was the first Bond film that they we did not adapt from a novel. They just came up with their own thing. The only thing that's similar, are we done? We're out of time. Well, oh, anyway, well, we'll tune see. in next week yeah. and we'll continue this conversation. Um, and we will continue with one of my favorite films on Her Majesty's Secret Service. More Connery. More Bond. Until then.